As usual, Nafisa Collier is making news. She's here to talk about it. As always, Locked On Women's Basketball starts now. Ogumba Wallet for the win. You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Well, a very happy Friday to you and welcome to Locked On Women's Basketball. I'm your host, Howard Magdal. I want to thank you for making us your first listen every day. Over 170,000 of you showed up in November alone to listen to us six days a week covering the past, present, and future of women's basketball. If you haven't yet, go ahead and subscribe at YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, it is not just me. It is the entire group over at The Next, thenexthoops.com. We have over 100 reported pieces every single month on women's basketball. $9 a month, $72 a year is how you subscribe, thenexthoops.com. Make sure you are supporting the work that's being done. And we cover women's basketball in just about every category, which means whether we're talking about the international game, whether we're talking about the WNBA game, whether we're talking about the impact that players are making on and off the court, Nafisa Collier keeps popping up. We keep talking about all the things you are doing, Fee. It's delightful to chat with you as always. And I guess the place we've got to start is Mila, everyone's favorite. (laughs) And I, I know she is hurling towards milestones. Take us through. What's she doing now? What's the latest? Oh, yeah. Mila's been a lot of fun. This has actually been my favorite age so far. She's so active. She loves sing and dance. We're working on our, we're working on it. Mm-hmm. Um, but she just has so much personality and I feel like she comes home with something new every single day, learning uh, something new. So it's just such a fun time. I'm having like just the best time every day. I'm delighted to hear it. Is, is the singing and dancing, what is her go-to song right now? She loves a song she learned at school, which is Dance, Dance, Mila. She loves singing that, so she sings that one herself to get us to sing it. So she could sing that one all day. She loves If You're Happy and You Know It, um, Old McDonald, anything that she can be active, uh, active in, uh, Wheels on the Bus, all that yeah. stuff. Oh, I love it. I love it. Oh, I miss that age with my girls. <laughs> but I'm, I'm oh, glad you to experience it. That is wonderful and and again it is part of everything that you're doing right now and there's so much going on on. Uh, the place i wish i want to start is just what you are doing in minnesota this week so uh, the marcy open school as i understand it had some vandalism uh, against their basket uh torn down take me through what you do about it what you learned from it and what you and the do about it Yeah, so I went there, as you said, their basketball hoop was vandalized and broken. And so we went there to kind of present a new hoop that they were putting up on um, on their playground at recess. And I got to play with them. We played some knockout and some other basketball games. I got to kind of talk to the kids a little bit. And it was so much fun. Um, They're fifth graders, so they had a lot of energy, which I loved. And they're so engaged and excited to be playing. So I love sports and I'm a really big advocate of kids playing sports. So to see them out there having such a great time and to be with them was really fun. Do you spend any time reflecting on when you were in fifth grade, there wasn't a Nafisa Collier type figure who was able to uh, be there and be a presence in the public eye in the same way, what it means to be in that position. I take it really seriously. And it's so cool to see the little kids who know who I am and who follow the links. And, um, you know, afterwards, like they were wanting autographs and to be that figure of someone in the community and especially like a women's basketball player that um, the little boys and little girls look up to and, you know, want to be like, um, I think it's really impactful. And I again, it's a job I take seriously. I know that we reach the youth a lot in our sport. And so to be a good role model for them, I think is a really you know, it's a big role and it's a big responsibility. So I love doing that and being active in the community and going out and seeing them and hopefully creating that fandom where this is the norm. It's not like, oh, I'm just starting to watch women's basketball. It'll be my favorite player is a woman's player um, first before a men's player. Uh, so it's really cool to kind of see that starting so young. Do you feel yeah. like that is a common thing here 
we're, I, and I can't really handle the fact that you're a veteran because I still remember vividly covering you in college. Uh, but, it, you know, we seem to have resonated in a new way with uh, culture and women's basketball being part of the greater culture. Does it feel that way to you? And can you feel it just from as somebody who's one of those key figures over that period of time, even since the moment you came in? I do feel it. And I feel the change even from when I was, I feel like it was yesterday too, that I was a rookie and in college, but I mean, it still hasn't been that long, only five seasons. And even in that short amount of time, I felt that shift of, um, you know, a lot of times, which is amazing. I love to be a role model for little girls and that's what I aspire to be. But now you kind of see the change of it's also little boys who are looking up to women's players, which that wasn't as much the case when I first came to the league. And so you're kind of seeing that shift where it's, I have a woman's favorite player and a men's favorite player, not just, you know, a, it's like a one B or a, a two. Um, so you're kind of seeing that rise and it's becoming more of the norm. Yeah, I love it. I love that it's more of a given rather than something where people are surprised by it or that exactly. it, it's a value add. Like, no, this is part of the landscape, period, you yeah. know, which which is just a beautiful thing to see. Uh, I, another way in which you're impacting off the court is a partnership you have with U.S. Bank to promote financial literacy. And so as somebody making your way in the world, as somebody who is figuring out financial literacy around raising a young family and, and, and coming into your own professionally, just take me through how your own journey helped make that such an important uh, thing for you to be able to pass on to others as well. Oh. Yeah, I am a really big advocate of financial literacy because I didn't start that journey until later, even in my career. You know, I'd been in the league a couple of years and um, I think I really think we should be learning this from like middle school. Kids should be learning how to budget, how to like those things are like an extracurricular class. It's not part of the like basic curriculum. And especially with the NIL deals in college, this should be a requirement for freshmen to have to take because they're seeing su so much money at such a young age, money they've never seen before. And it's really easy to say, I see that in my bank account, I can blow it on this, this and this mm -hmm. and not think about, OK, I'm going to need that money for the future or I may not play professional basketball. This may be the most money I'm going to see in my life, like this amount in such a short amount of time. So learning how to budget, learning how to do your taxes. Uh, things like that, I think it's so important. And U.S. Bank has done an amazing job of tailoring it to our league mm -hmm. because what we have to deal with is not what, you know, most of the public or not public, but most of most regular people have to deal with. We have to pay taxes in every state that we play in. You have to take into account overseas and how the taxes work there. Um, you know, our career is not like a longevity thing. Like most people, when they go into their career, we have a finite amount of time to make this money. And so we have to make the most of it and make sure that it lasts and we create that wealth and hopefully create wealth for the rest of our family. So um, they've done a great job of tailoring it to our needs and listening to us. And um, so I've been really happy with working with them. How much harder do you think it is to be a star in college now than even five years ago. I mean, I know we keep talking about how it feels like just yesterday, but obviously there are these sea changes. I mean, do, do you do you ever think about that? Do you think about just the fact that having played in, you know, right before NIL, how much more complicated everything has become? And, you know, how, how do you kind of pass that along when it's so different? It's so different for, you know, a page or an AZ at UConn than it was even uh, for, you know, for your group. It is. And while I am sad that I missed that, because obviously I wish I could have made money in college. Yeah. Um, it also comes with the maturity of I was older when I started making that money. So I realized, you know, I think I was just like a little bit mature in that way. So mm -hmm. I definitely don't envy the people in college who are, you know, kids coming out of high school with all of a sudden there's a hundred thousand dollars thrown at them for going to a school or this school's offering th them this much money to go there. And they just have to worry about so many things other than just playing basketball, which is what college is really about. Um, so while I think it's an amazing thing and I I'm happy that we have NIL, I definitely don't envy that side of it because it's a lot of pressure on top of school, which is very stressful. Um, they're playing so many games, you know, trying to make the tournament, things like that. The struggles that college life that comes with college life. Um, so I think there are pros and cons to it. There, there was always a maturity in you and your game, you know, Gino Oriyama, who is yeah. just very happy to call people out. He always talked about yes. that with you. So I'm sure you would have handled anything that came your way, but it definitely, 
has gotten to a next level for sure. Uh, last thing before we head to break, and then we talk about all things Minnesota, but um, I have to ask this question. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but Mila obviously would win any baby race that would happen among the babies of the WNBA. Who would come in second? Ooh, are we talking all that? What's the age range also? All WNBA babies. I'm willing to make everyone eligible. I, I'm willing to keep this open-ended. You know, take me through your thoughts about it. And we have to make well, this I'm, happen. This has got to be like all-star weekend, right? It's got to have yeah. babies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if we're talking babies around the same age, I think Ruby, she's pretty tall. Her legs are long. She looks pretty fast. Stewie's daughter and probably Candace's son, Air. Yeah. I think those I think those two would be stiff competition. Yeah, it, it, it would be a fascinating thing to see. Ruby was very active uh, when Stewie got her MVP. Uh, so yeah. you could see it. You could, you could see that up close. It would be very interesting to see. Okay, so anyway, it's yeah. just... Just a, just a free idea, just putting it out there. <laughs> yeah. 2024. Uh, much more to come uh, about all things Lynch and all things Fee uh, after this. But first, I want to take you guys through a sponsor that we have, which is Dave.com. And Dave.com gives you an opportunity to use a banking app that's leveling up the financial playing field. It's giving you opportunities to find out uh, some you know, interest-free loans up to $500 in five minutes or less with no credit check or no late fees. It's part of Dave's extra cash account. It advances the money you need with no interest and you settle up later. The best part to my mind about this is that when you pay on time, it helps your credit score. It makes a difference in terms of being able to build credit, which is not always easy for some people to do. So download Dave today at dave.com slash locked on NBA. That's dave.com slash locked on NBA or, or download the Dave app now for terms and conditions go to dave.com slash legal eligibility criteria and instant transfer fees apply banking services provided by evolve member fdic so we're back with nafisa collier and as fee as you know i am a stat nerd and so it's very hard for me to isolate on the things that i find most amazing about your game and its evolution but i think i need to start at something pretty basic you are the current active leader in minutes played per game you average 33.5 it is in a lot of ways a throwback to uh stars of uh yesteryear and mm -hmm. i guess i just wonder how satisfying just off the top is the fact that not only do you hold that, but this year coming back with all that you have had to figure out both in terms of your body, in terms of play, and in terms of even just the changes in Minnesota, you were right at your career average of 33.5. Um, I mean, I love it. Obviously, I want to be on the court as much as I can. And definitely when Cheryl calls my name, I'm I'm going to be out there. So uh, I never think about like how many minutes I'm playing. I'm just thinking about winning the game and I want to be out there. So it's not like it's a burden, obviously, in any way. Uh, so I'm going to keep doing it as long as my body allows. And um, I want to be on the court. That's the goal. That's why you play. So I like it. Cheryl has always talked about the struggle she has, especially with the vets when she had, you know, still mm -hmm. in her mid thirties and, um, you know, later career, Simone Augustus of like, I've got to limit their minutes. I've got to, Fight that battle. Is that something you see that happens internally? Because you're always going to say yes to it um, to figure mm -hmm. it out. Or is your hope that you get to even push it even more? Um, well, thankfully, I'm not to that point yet how right. Simone and Syl were. Uh, so I don't know how they felt about it. But I'm to the point where I'm still good with being on the court that long. And I wanted them on the court with me. So <laughs> I wanted us all out there. It, it, it was a very significant thing for me to see, not just – that you were out there, but you were at a new level of efficiency, despite the fact that you were being asked to do more. So your usage rate jumped to 28.9%. This is, of course, a new era that we understood, if you'll forgive the phrase, the Nafisa Collier era here in Minnesota. And so thinking about the things you did this year, just kind of take you inside a couple of them. Your turnover percentage was way down. You were essentially being able to limit those mistakes, despite the fact that, like I said, you're on the court all the time and being, you know, essentially number one on the opposition scouting report. What do you think accounted for that? How do you figure out ways to limit turnovers? And, you know, how did you put that into practice this past season? 
I was probably shooting more <laughs> is one way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, although it, it was not at the expense of your assist percentage, 15.5%. You were oh, above your overall career line with that. So you, you oh, had, nice. yeah, I know, but, but go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I think just being more aware of that too, because I felt like I, I was a little bit high in my turnovers in previous seasons. And so it's something I really focused on. And it's a waste of possession, you know, having a turnover, especially making silly mistakes like offensive fouls is where I get a lot of my turnovers as well. Um, so just being aware of that, I think. Um, and I don't know, I guess just being more crisp with my passes. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, too. I mean, you talked about that. Your, your, your foul rate was also a career low. So, again, in all these different ways, when you dig into the numbers, there are all these ways in which you not only came back stronger than ever, but you came back more efficient than ever. I'm, in terms of the passing, you talked about this. I think it's so interesting, the parallels between the way UConn played and the way Cheryl plays. The fact that, you know, mm -hmm. as I, I, I never know what to call you, a big, you're like a big wing, you know, you, you, you yeah. manage to bring the ball up some of the time, like you do all of it, right? Like you're in a position where you're doing a bit of everything. Do you feel those parallels between Gino's offense and what Cheryl runs? Yeah, I mean... I don't know about like the offense per se, but their styles are very similar, just who they are as coaches. So what they expect on offense, like mm -hmm. I wouldn't say like play, I mean, you know, like play for play, what we're calling is like the same, but what they expect, like the efficiency, the teamwork, the, um, you know, attention to detail is very, very much similar to what I had with coach uh, Gino in college. And then in terms of USA basketball, just kind of taking your game to that level as well. Is that an easier conversion because it's Cheryl in both instances? Yeah. Do you kind of have a sense of what to expect? Does she sound different? Is she asking different things? Like, what is that like for you as a player to hear her, but in a different way? So I haven't had her as a head coach yet at USA since okay. I wasn't with them in um, the past two, you know, cycles, I was pregnant and then I missed this first one, mm -hmm. but I had her as an assistant, you know, in the last Olympics. So I think it's just also kind of a comfort to have her there to have, because I'm so familiar with Cheryl and, um, you know, be on the Olympic team for the first time, obviously it's a big deal and a little bit intimidating. So having her there was really reassuring, just mm -hmm. having, I knew I had someone in my corner. I knew I had someone who knew me. So I'm really excited to have her as the head coach as well, because, Obviously, I've had her for the past five seasons, and I think she's an amazing coach, so I know she's going to do great things with the USA team, um, and I'm excited to, like, take it another round with her again. I mean, that goal, that has to be central to the way you think about 24, and, like, we'll talk about, like, the Nafisa Collier plan writ large for 2024, but mm -hmm. is that kind of at the top of your list when you think about the year ahead, uh, just on the court? The Olympics? Yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's what I've been thinking about since the last Olympics. Just having that gold medal put around my neck and laying on my chest is just such an amazing feeling. It's such a rush. I mean, it's something that's been on my bucket list since I started watching the Olympics, ever since I can remember and started playing basketball. So I want to do it, like recreate that as many times as I can. And I love France. I've been to Paris a couple of times and doing it there. I think it's going to be beautiful. Last time it was COVID, so I'm excited to like experience the Olympics in full as well. So there's just so many things. Like I, I hope you know I would have a bigger role this year too. I was just happy to be there last time, obviously. But as you you know do more and more times, you hope to have a bigger role. So there's just so many things I'm looking forward to in this next Olympics. I'm really excited about it. And and again, we'll talk after this break about 24. But before we do, um, just what is that early memory? Like, what's your first memory of watching USA basketball? Which is obviously, you know, we've been dominant for mm -hmm. a couple of generations now, going back to mm -hmm. 90s. What, what do you remember? Yeah. Oh, gosh. I just remember, like, it's just a snapshot, actually. Like, my first memory, I remember, like, laying in bed. It's me, my brother, and my parents. And we're just putting, like, we all are getting in bed because of the game's coming on like watching it. So it's just like, you know, you kind of see like a picture in your mind. Like that's the first one that I remember. And then of course we did it every four years after that. I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, we'll be back with, uh, with all that there is on the court as well with the future Collier along with uh, talking recruiting uh, right after this, but first. 
Just want to let you folks know at home about Prize Picks. And Prize Picks is a daily fantasy sports platform in North America, uh, much to their credit, uh, men's and women's players as well. And they, in fact, have a really interesting combo thing going on right now where you can be in a specials league. And it's a combo projections across, you know, right now it's the NBA and the NFL. So you can have like LeBron James and Travis Kelsey in a combination of three pointers made and receptions. There's also a chance to play along some of Prize Picks' favorite players like rapper Meek Mill, comedian Andrew Schultz. You just go to the Community Plays under the Promos tab of the app, and you can view entries from some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community. How do you do it? Well, go to prizepicks.com slash LockedOnNBA and use code LockedOnNBA. You can get a first deposit match of up to $100. Again, that is prizepicks.com slash L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-B-A. Make sure you give it a shot. See how Prize Picks works for you. Prize Picks, a better way to play daily fantasy. Sophie, as we head into 24, I know that you have talked about being a recruiter for Minnesota. (laughs) So take me through how you approach that. What is your, you know, is there a playbook tailored to particular players (laughs) you're trying to get? Are you thinking in terms of just like big picture, you know, what Minnesota needs? Is it in, you know, conjunction with conversations where the links are like, hey, we want to bring in the big guns. Let's bring in fee. Like, how does it happen? Take me through it. Yeah. So it's looking what we like at the team and looking what we need for the next season. So what areas did we struggle with last season? What do we need to be successful to make a championship run? That's always the goal. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we're talking about this all the time and I'm pretty involved. I mean, as you kind of said, this is my team now, obviously I plan to stay here. And so I want us to be as successful as possible. So any recruits we have, I'm pretty active. I'm talking to them, you know, I'm coming to their, uh, recruiting trips, like when they're here, we went to tar- Turkey a couple years ago. So I'm pretty active in that process. Having Kayla signed for the long term and having that happen mm-hmm. in the off season meeting, how much of a light up does that give you guys in terms of just thinking about what you can be, where you can be? I and mean, we talked about this last time on the show as a two person duo, you and Kayla mm-hmm. were on the very best in terms of a range of efficiency categories in the entire league. Yeah, I love playing with Max. She's, I mean, I think that our connection on the court is, as you can, like you said, you can see it. I can feel it when I'm out there. I just feel really comfortable playing with her. It's been, we've been together four years now. Has it been four years? Yeah, three years. I don't know. It feels like forever. (laughs) Um, So it's just such a relief to have her here for the remainder of my contract as well. So um, for the next couple of years. So I think it definitely sets a great foundation for us. And it, it's a, also a great recruiting tool. Like these are the players we have. We have great players signed here and we want you to come play with us, you know? So um, I'm really excited for the future with Mac. And, and this feels like a weird question to ask, given how you are succeeding in all these different areas. But like, I know you and I know you're always looking for how you're getting better. So like, what's that next level for you is there a particular skill you have in mind is there a particular way in which you think you can impact the game beyond what you already do i'm just what what is that on your agenda well a big thing i'm working on this off season is strength training so not necessarily like putting on muscle but functional strength training Hmm. um so i think that will help me a lot and then you know some things on the court like i want to be able to shoot threes on the move i'm pretty much a set, set shooter now I want that percentage to go up as well. And then ball handling, which includes like change of direction off the dribble, things like that. And more important, in terms of the overall experience, and you you know, you're in the midst of building Unrivaled for a 2025 debut and a new league off the court. Again, you know, Mm -hmm. and just this is a point of personal privilege to to my listeners, what Nafisa Collier is doing matters in all these different ways and just resonates in all these different ways. But so I need to know for you, does this feel like something approaching an ideal off season? You are balancing all the things we talked about. It, it boggles my mind. You're in the midst of building infrastructure for something bigger. Do you feel like as we head into what is a likely opt out, what is a likely major pay when it comes uh, from the WNBA receiving a new media rights deal after 2025, like we are going toward 
what this needs to feel like during the offseason as well? I think yes. I mean, the future just seems so bright, you know. Women's sports is on such a rise, and I've said this time and time again, but people in women's sports have always known the gem that we have and how amazing the product that we have is, and it feels like the rest of the world is finally starting to catch up. Uh, so it's really exciting to see that after this new CBA, like what the pay is going to look like, what our league's going to look like. You know, obviously charter flights is a huge point of contention in our league expansion. Um, and with the different leagues, like AU is a league that's, um, you know, uh, you can stay in the United States to play. Unrivaled will be a league that you can stay in the United States to play. So just building upon what we have, um, obviously that's ideal for me is to play in the W and then play in Unrivaled in the off season where you still get a break, but you are making money and then you get to play against the top players in the world. Um, so I'm really excited for, you know, what the next couple of years are going to bring. Yeah. Summer's in Minnesota, winter's Miami. That sounds about right. That's yeah, sounds, exactly. That sounds good for everyone. So, and, yeah. and yes, charters, we will continue to talk about that in 2024. I can assure you as well. Well, Nafisa Collier, it is always delightful to catch up on all the things you are doing. And uh, we're always glad to have you on the program. To our listeners, thank you so much, of course, for making us your first listen every day. We'll be back with you tomorrow with a WNBA draft focused pod. We'll be back with you next week, heading into winter break with a lot more to come. Until then, I am Howard Magdal, wishing all of you a wonderful weekend. Welcome to Wallet. For the win. You are Locked On Women's Basketball, your daily podcast on women's basketball. 